You know when you hear those songs? Those songs that just speak to you. Those songs that, that make you feel like you can conquer the world. And those songs that connect with you at your lowest points. Music is a powerful influence in our lives, and it has been for years. These are the original Songs of Summer. Well, good morning and welcome to Northridge. My name is Josh, as Drew mentioned. I'm the, okay. Yay. It's only downhill from here, guys, if you're clapping this early. Um, welcome, welcome to Northridge. If you're joining us from one of our physical locations, one of our four campuses, thanks for braving the oppressive heat. Just remember, you asked for this back in January and in April, and here we are. Um, if you're joining us live online, or maybe you're checking out this video during the week, we're just glad that you joined us. Again, I'm Josh. I'm the director of outreach here. And since many of you don't know me, I thought I'd take just a minute to give you a little bit of my background. I came to the Rochester area originally to go to undergrad at RIT. I wanted to be a scientist. I went on to University of Rochester to earn my master's and my PhD in the field of biophysics. It's not that hard to say, right? Biophysics. Drew, it's not that hard to say. Um, <laughs> But when people hear that that's my background in science, they make assumptions about the kind of personality that I have, that I'm a logical thinker, that I like things organized, I like systems and processes, I need data and evidence to back up claims, and that's all 100% true. That is my personality type. But I do have a soft side. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I was at the house that I grew up in, and my mom was pulling some old boxes out of the attic, and she brought a box to me and told me to go through it. And you know what box I'm talking about. You've all got it. If you've got it for your kids, or maybe your mom or grandma has one of these boxes for you, this is that box of memories. Old photographs, old toys, maybe clothing you came home from the hospital in, yearbooks, all that kind of stuff. And I thought I would go through some of my favorites from the bin with you guys. So first up, 1995 Pinewood Derby Trophy, <laughs> second place. <laughs> I'm a winner. My first job, newspaper carrier. I won in the year 2000, Outstanding Newspaper Carrier of the Year. <laughs> oh man, I love this one so much. 1993, 1994, first quarter, second grade, perfect attendance. <laughs> My mom was real proud of me, I'll tell you what. And then, of course, the giant stack of yearbooks from elementary school, middle school, and high school. And if I'm coming off awkward on the stage today, you should have seen me in high school. And that's why I love church so much. You people have to like me. Jesus says so, so it's okay. <laughs> but the reason I bring this all up is because in that bin, I found these old literary magazines from my time at RIT. See, while I was studying science as my main focus, on the side, I was writing poetry and prose. I was a creative writing minor. And so I thought I'd get real vulnerable with you guys today, and I'd read to you one of the poems that I wrote in college. <laughs> this piece is called Another Color. On the street corner, alone but not unaided, before dark hallways, between steel walls without ceilings, on a green and blue canvas against backdrops of black. Each stroke swaying the scene. Just one dab, and everything changes. It's good, right? Yeah. I don't know what any of it means, but I love it. I think it's so cool. And I know some of you are judging me right now. On the back of your programs, there's a place to take notes today. This isn't in your notes. Please write this down. Real men read poetry. Real men read poetry. You know who read poetry? You know who quoted poetry? Jesus. It's true. Jesus had this incredible respect for the ancient text of the Israelites, what we Christians would call today the Old Testament. And a huge portion of the Old Testament is poetic in nature. In fact, right in the center of our Bibles is this collection of 150 poems we call the Psalms. Now, Psalm is another word for a sacred song, so be more accurate to describe these as sets of song lyrics. And again, Jesus took these texts so seriously. He quoted from the Old Testament. He used it to teach about God and to prove points. And what text do you think Jesus quoted from more than any other text in our Old Testament? The Psalms. Jesus quoted from an ancient collection of Hebrew lyrics more than any other text in our Bibles. 
And because he took them seriously, I think we should as well. And so today, I'm kicking off a new series called Songs of Summer, where we're going to dive into the Psalms. We're going to learn about the Psalms as a collection, as a book, and also dive deep into a handful of Psalms to learn more about God and what we can apply to our faith journeys. And I love this so much. I think the Psalms are really special. Because here's the thing. We all know that music intrinsically can communicate things that written word alone cannot. Music moves us, it stirs us, it makes us want to act, it makes us want to respond. We're able to say things in refreshing and engaging ways that simply written word alone cannot do. So I'm going to kick us off today by looking at Psalm 146, my favorite psalm. If you want, you can turn to page 509 in the Northridge Bibles, or you can follow along in the Bible app on your phone if you want to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read through Psalm 146 one time in its entirety, and then I'm going to go back and break it up into a couple chunks and try to tease out what I think the author is saying. And when I say the author, I say it that way because many of the Psalms are attributed to a handful of different people. Many of them are attributed to King David, an ancient Israelite king, and there are a couple other people who wrote Psalms. But Psalm 146 falls into this collection of Psalms that we don't know who the author was. It's unattributed, so in this, I'm going to refer to the psalmist or the author as we go because we don't know who wrote it. Nothing in the text implies or gives that away. So let's begin in Psalm 146, verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Your Lord, or the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Again, a relatively short passage, only 10 verses, but I think there's a few things we can take away, and I'd find the first one in verses 1 through 5. Take again another look with me at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And I'd pause here after two to just mention one quick thing. The only command we see in the entire psalm, we find it at the very beginning and again at the very end. And that command is to praise the Lord. And then the psalmist says they're going to praise the Lord as long as they live. And the question we immediately want to ask is why? Why are we praising the Lord? Look again at verse three. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. So in verse 3, we cannot put our trust in humans or in princes. And we all get that. I mean, look around today, right? As our government, as a society, as our culture becomes more and more polarized, we realize kind of intuitively that no king, no prince, no president, no congressperson, no military leader is going to save us from all that is wrong in this world. A great leader can come, make some positive changes, steer us in the right direction, but someday that great leader is going to die or be outed as a fraud and we'll be right where we were before. So why do we praise the Lord? We praise the Lord because it is God who can be trusted. God can be trusted. The psalmist recognizes that human beings, man, we are frail. My lifespan compared to the entirety of human history is an insignificant blip. And so we look outside of human history to something eternal, to a God who is eternal. And he continues to build his case in verse 6, where he says, He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. The psalmist is saying, what worries are there really in this world when we can look to the very one who created this world? If you jump down with me to verse 10, verses 6 and 10 make bookends that I think wrap up the second half of the psalm so well. Verse 10 says, The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. It says God reigns, active, that's present tense, he's currently reigning, but also into the future for all generations. And I think the psalmist's second point here is God is always there. God was there at creation, verse 6. He reigns today, he's actively reigning, and will reign into the future forever. And that's in verse 10. And then we wrap up the psalm by looking at verses 7 through 9. 7, he upholds the cause of the oppressed, and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. 
The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. So here we have the psalmist describing a few categories of people that we would say, you know, they're vulnerable or they're hurting, they're in pain, they're suffering in some capacity, or they're marginalized, they're on the outside of society, easily taken advantage of. The oppressed, the hungry, the prisoner, the blind, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, that God is looking out for them, that God loves those who do good, the word it uses is the righteous, and God frustrates the ways of those who would do evil. I think the psalmist is declaring that God cares. God cares about big picture pain and suffering in our world and about individuals who are experiencing that suffering. He cares about the pain in your life. He's active in crushing injustice and helping those who are hurting. And as I look over the entire psalm, those three main points, that God cares, he's always there, and he can be trusted, I would summarize the psalm this way, that God is committed to our good. The author's main point is right there in verse 3. We can't trust humans. And then spends the rest of the psalm making the case that it is God who is committed to our good. God is the one that we can trust. The psalmist is declaring that we have a God who stands outside of history, outside of time, and yet intervenes to engage with the individuals who are hurting in our world. And here's where I want to ask an honest question. I mean, I'm 10 minutes into this message and I've rolled through the psalm, the main points, and many of you are wondering, you know, really? Can we really believe that God is committed to our good? If you grew up in church, if you're familiar with psalm language, you don't even notice the tension anymore. But for many of you, we look out over the world and we say, God, is God really working for the good of those people? Does God really care? Is he really committed to our good? Around the world today, tens of millions of people are caught up in one of the largest exoduses in human history as they flee their homes because of death and persecution and war in countries like Syria, Sudan, Somalia, and Afghanistan. Around the world, over two million children are caught up in a commercial sex trafficking trade. In our own country, over 400,000 kids are in the foster care system just waiting for their families to be able to get back together and offer to get things figured out to bring their children home. In our own communities, if you drive around for any length of time, you'll find somebody on a street corner, possibly a veteran, with a sign asking for a few dollars to grab a bite to eat. Head behind a warehouse, down some alleys, into some of our parks and parking lots, you'll find needles as an opioid epidemic crushes our communities and devastates families. And whatever it is you're facing in your life, I'm sure you've got pain and suffering or someone close to you has experienced pain and suffering, whether it's cancer, job loss, the loss of a child, broken marriage, broken relationships, whatever it is that you've experienced or someone close to you has experienced, we've all faced some kind of pain. We've all had those moments where we've questioned, is God really committed to our good? And while I can't speak to the pain that each and every person at all of our campuses is facing, I can speak to mine. And my wife and I have experienced pain in our lives and in our marriage. My wife and I are foster parents. Uh, We try to provide a safe place for kids to come and find a comfortable, safe, loving place, a place where they can thrive while they wait for mom, dad, grandma, whoever needs to figure out their next steps, get healthy, get sober, get things together, whatever it takes to bring a child home. And four years ago, my wife and I brought home a six-week-old baby boy, Rooney. Uh, I call him Rooney, don't use his real name, don't show his face in the pictures, just to protect his privacy as he's still connected to the foster care system. But we brought home this six-week-old baby boy, and my biological son at the time, Aaron, was two and was thrilled out of his mind to have a baby brother. And so for this season, mom, dad, two little boys doing what a family of four does, adventures and outings, and we did it with some bonus extended family. As we got to know Rooney's family and invited them, them into our lives, we shared birthdays together, holidays, they came over for Christmas and Thanksgiving, we did Easter egg hunts at Easter, we did all we could to involve them in our lives and to be one big family. But after a year and a half in our home, the court system started having a conversation. Hey, we've got to get Rooney into a permanent situation, whatever that might look like. Either send him back to his biological family, hopefully they have the tools ready to care for him, or have him adopted into the foster family. And in our particular case, the decision was made to start heading towards reunifying him with his biological family. And my wife and I had some significant hesitations. He has some developmental things he's been working through, and we were afraid that he would regress. We were afraid of what he would be exposed to. We were afraid for their ability to care for him. And please, I mean, don't hear me. I'm not judging them. They had the same hesitations. They delayed his return multiple times over the course of a few months 
because we all had these fears about what everyone was capable of doing and what his environment would look like. But despite our objections, after a year and a half in our home, just shy of his second birthday, we packed up all of his clothes into some bags. We packed up a lot of his favorite toys. We sent along some odd nens that they needed for their house. And we sent this child, Rooney, that we had gotten to know as our son to live with another family. And my wife and I agree that this was the hardest season of our lives and the hardest season of our marriage, a child that we had come to know as one of our own and to send him away. So I would love to read to you. When I, when I got home from sending Rooney away, we went into our apartment and kind of looked around and I was having one of these, you know, I write poetry, you know that. So I was having one of these moments and so I wrote a blog post that day just describing what I saw and what I was feeling. So I would love to read to you a small piece of that today. There's no lights for this, you'll be good. Starting today, there is a car seat in our van without a passenger. There's a crib nobody will be sleeping in. There are toys that will not go played with. There's one particular car ramp that won't be seeing any races. There's a spot at the table that will be empty. There's a sink that will have far fewer dishes. A special nighttime song will go unsung. Mornings will start an hour later and bedtimes will be an hour shorter. Family movie night will be less frantic. Going to the store will be less of an adventure. There's a baby, shamp There's a baby shampoo that will sit unused and a bath towel and mittens and a hat and boots and a raincoat. His favorite possession, his toothbrush, oddly enough, and that went with him. But now there are only three in the cup by the sink. Over a year and a half in our home comes to an end. There's a young boy without his younger brother to follow him around. There's a dad without his youngest wrestling partner. And there's a mother without her baby. And this is where I ask the question, why God? If you're always there, if you care, if we can trust you, if you are committed to this child's good, where are you? Where are you? Why are you sending this child away from a safe, loving home where he's got mom and dad, he's got an older brother, he's got everything he needs, and he's flourishing, he's succeeding? Why? Why send him away to uncertainty, to an unsafe situation? Why? I demanded that God would intervene in this child's life to do something, to be on his side, to be committed to his good. And what I had missed was that for his first two years of life, God had been intervening in this child's life and in his family's lives. God had been intervening for the good of this child. See, this child had something that he didn't have otherwise. This child had a dad. I got to be the only father this child has ever known. He's never met his biological father. So for these first two years, my son had a dad. And he had a mom. He had two moms. He had an older brother. He had a safe and loving environment. God had intervened in this child's life in his first two years to care for him and to love him and to impact his family. I learned that, you know, God's not in the business of waving his hands and magically resolving all of the pain and suffering in our lives. For every story that you can come up with of some otherworldly coincidence that we attribute to the miraculous hand of God, I will show you a dozen stories of life change where the people of God serve God by serving others. See, God is committed to our good. And his primary vehicle for doing it is through us, through followers of Jesus, through his church. So God is committed to our good, and we must be committed to the good of others. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells this fascinating story about a day in the future where he's going to sit on a throne as king and separate the people of the world into two groups, those who follow and those who are not followers of Jesus. And then in verse 34, it says, the king will say to those on his right, these are those who are followers of Jesus, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger or foreigner and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I mean, these are a lot of the same categories as what we saw in Psalm 146. And the crowd looks at this king in the story and is totally confused. I don't remember when you were in prison. When were you sick? When were you thirsty? We didn't do any of this for you. And then, then in verse 40, it says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He appears to be saying that one of the distinguishing characteristics of a follower of Jesus, what separates us from the other crowd, is our care, our compassion for the poor, for the needy, for the hurting. 
See, humans are one of the greatest causes of pain, suffering, and destruction in our world. You know that. You turn on the nightly news, and I feel like half the stories are either humans doing awful things to other humans or a natural disaster, and humans respond in an awful way, right? But when we orient our lives to follow God, to make Him our leader, and then we serve others, engage with others, we become the primary vehicle through which God brings incredible good to our world. And so how does this work, and what do we do? I would say we pray, we give, and we go. We start with prayer. See, Jesus, there's a story where he teaches his disciples how to pray. And there's this line in that prayer. If you're not familiar, we call this the Lord's Prayer. Um, There's this line in the middle where he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whether we want to admit it or not, we're all little kingdom creators. Before I followed Jesus, I was building this kingdom that was all about me, with me on the throne. I buy my car, my house, I take care of my kids, I take care of my wife, I do all these things to build my little kingdom with my pleasure, my family, all of me on the throne. But when we follow Christ, when we make him the center of our lives, we put Christ on the throne and we build a little pocket of God's kingdom on earth. And so all of us, his church, his followers, together we are creating these little pockets of God's kingdom everywhere, where we work, where we play, where we live holding back the effects of sin and death and destruction in our world in just small ways. I've heard prayer described as an act of rebellion where we look out over the world and we say, you know what? It kind of looks like sin and death and suffering are just the norm that they're in charge of this world. And so when we pray, we beg God, God, I am sick of the status quo. I want you on the throne. I want this world to be the way you intended it to be. I'm tired of all of this pain and suffering that's not from you. And so we beg God to intervene and to be on that throne. I mean, look back in verse 3 in the psalm, in Psalm 146. We don't put our trust in humans or princes. Those earthly kingdoms will fall away. They're going to go away someday. But God's kingdom will last forever. So when disaster strikes in our world or down the street, we pray. But we don't stop there. We give and we go. We pray first because we need to be constantly reminded that it's God who's in control. But then we just have to recognize that the primary way he answers those prayers is often through other people. And so when disaster strikes and we beg God to intervene and do something and then we do nothing, we're essentially begging God to send somebody else because that's how he tends to respond to that kind of pain and suffering. Now, I'm not saying every time something bad happens, you've got to run out and do something. I promise you, you will be so burned out. There is so much to deal with. But I am saying that we can all stretch to be greater difference makers in our community and in our world. And I know there's one other hesitation that many of you are feeling. I feel it too when I think about something like this. That I need to deal with my own stuff before I can help someone else. That I've got my own suffering, my own pain I need to work through before I can deal with someone else's pain and suffering. That I need to get it together before I can help someone else. Well, here's the thing. If we all wait until we've got it all together before we serve, none of us are serving. That's just the reality of it. None of us will serve. Do you think I've got it all together? Oh, no. Do you think our staff, our incredible volunteers who pull off Sunday mornings, do you think they've got it all together? No. Do you think Drew has it all together? (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. The only one who ever had it all together always had it all together. Jesus. And that guy was fully God. He so had it all together. He held the entire universe together. And so we can't wait until we've got it all together to get out there and serve, to make a difference, to invest. And it's worth noting, just as a a kind of a quick aside, I don't have time to go into this, but God often chooses to heal us through our serving. Sometimes God uses the pain in our lives, the suffering we've experienced to bring hope and healing to someone else. And when we do that, we find the space to explore our pain, explore our suffering, and then God often works through that to bring us healing, to bring us growth. So here's my challenge for us, myself included, two things. On one side, to trust that God is so committed to our good, that he really is. And on the other hand, to be committed to the good of others, to make space in my life to be the answer to prayer for someone else. See, I think this is really the essence of being a follower of Jesus. We have this thing, the gospel, the good news about what Jesus has done for us. We believe that Jesus came and died for our sin, 
that God demonstrated his ultimate commitment for our good, commitment to our good, when he sent Jesus to the cross to die on our behalf. And we need to remember that. We need to learn that. We need to internalize that. I mean, I struggle to do that. I need to be reminded daily, hourly, sometimes every minute of what God has done for me. But when I internalize that, I turn around and I leverage that for others. I sacrifice like Jesus. I live like Jesus on behalf of others. I would summarize the gospel in our response this way, trust and obey. That we trust that God is committed to our good and then obey him by loving like Jesus. Obey him by serving others. So let's do this. On the connections card, attached to your program, two boxes that I would challenge you to think through checking. The first one says, I want to trust that God is committed to my good. Check that box. <clears throat> Let us know that you're committing to trust that God is committed to your good. And if you're not signed up for our equip emails, we'll start sending those to you. Our equip emails go out every week, all year long, with helpful resources, articles, videos to help you grow in your faith. And this week's email will be focused on suffering. Why does suffering exist? What is God doing through our suffering? How can we serve in the midst of suffering? What does it all mean? Why? And then as far as serving goes, let's start right where we are with the relationships we already have. Who in your community group? Who in your neighborhood? Who in your workplace? Who among your family members and friends? Can you start to serve? Can you start to love? Can you step in and help? When tragedy strikes, bring a meal. When a couple's burned out, offer to babysit. When somebody can't stay ahead, invite yourself over to mow the lawn, do the dishes, patch a hole, fix the stairs, whatever we can do to help. When somebody says, man, things are hard, instead of responding with, oh, that's too bad, I hope it gets better, let's step up and serve. And if you aren't sure where to start, or maybe you want to take your serving to another level or try something new, check that second box. It says, I want to commit to the good of others. And what I'll do is I'll send you an email this week with a number of ways you can start getting engaged right here in our community, and I'm going to use Psalm 146 as my template. And so I'll show you how you can serve the hungry and homeless out on the streets or in our local shelters. I'll share with you how you can get into our local jails and connect with inmates and share with them. How you can walk alongside a foreigner by serving a refugee family just figuring out how to live in the United States. I'll connect you with adoptive families so you can hear their stories of how God grew their families through adoption. And my wife and I and others are making time this summer to connect with any families who are interested in talking about what it might mean to be a foster family yourselves. So check those boxes, drop those in the buckets when they pass in just a few minutes or in the baskets at any of our doors, at any of our auditoriums on the way out. And before we're done, I just want to say a couple more things just real quickly. The first is, don't feel any guilt over this. My goal is not to guilt you into serving. God wants joyful givers and joyful servants. And I think you will find incredible joy in serving others. In fact, I think you will find joy as the answer to this question. What if you are the way God wants to make a dent in some area of serving in our world today? And as a church, we're trying to make this more and more a part of our DNA. We do this thing every Christmas we call Beyond where we raise money and we go out and serve and we're trying to invest outside the walls of our church, beyond the walls of our church, in our community and around the world. But here's the thing, that can't be just about giving and it can't be just about Christmas time. We want this to be a natural rhythm of our church, of people who claim to follow Jesus. We want this to be a part of our DNA. And so hear me out, we're a church of over 2,000 people. Do you know that? Over 2,000 people meeting at four campuses every Sunday morning? What would it look like if over 2,000 people humbled themselves enough to say, God, I trust that you're committed to my good, even if I don't understand why it's happening the way it is. I'm trusting that you're committed to my good. And then those same 2,000 people turn around and be committed to the good of others, to sacrifice on behalf of others, to make a difference in our community. I can tell you what that would be. That would be the most beautiful, humble force for good our community has ever, ever seen. In the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us he, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a day in the future. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Suffering exists because humanity rebelled against God's beautiful original plan for this world. And we've been feeling the effects of the sin in this world ever since. And when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sin, he won victory over death. But this in between period before he comes again and wipes away all that pain and suffering, this in between period, this old order, this is where we live. 
And you and I, we are the hands and feet of God to serve a broken, devastated, hurting world. Will you join me? Will you join me in stepping out and serving our world and serving our community to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the incredible sacrifice of your son on our behalf. And I pray that today each of us would figure out what role we might play to best reflect Jesus, to love others, to care for others, to serve others, to meet needs around us. Help us to figure out what role we can play. God, we trust that you are committed to our good and want to be committed to the good of others. Work through our hearts, work in our lives to make that a reality. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.